the term reparation or ecological reparation, I mean, one of the things that I like about the, 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 the term um, is that it carries some more weight um, or even power than um, other terms that are more familiar in this kind of, say, field, or like restoration, for example, or re remediation. And certainly, at least in the context that we work, um, I would say that uh, work around restoration and remediation tend to be you know, dominated by certain kinds of scientific um, methods and um, uh, interventions that tend to maybe erase or uh, marginalize the more sort of social and political histories of the places and the landscapes that we're working in and working with. And something about reparation is that it it makes clear that the kind of damage that is done to these places and landscapes is not, um, you know, it was not inevitable, uh, that, that hasn't just appeared. Um, and it, it also sort of suggests something like a kind of a debt, maybe, or um, a, a kind of obligation. Uh, and it's certainly, in my head at least, it, it connects to ideas of ecological debt, you know, which is used in a, in a different context. What kind of draws us to it a little bit is the ambivalence of the issue of repair and how it can kind of describe a number of different practices that range, you know, from what Patty was saying, you know, these kinds of like submerged perspectives, the small scale practices that have, you know, thrived and endured in spite of, you know, like colonial capitalist domination in these particular places, you know, especially the bogs. Um, and I think that repair is a, is a term that kind of gets at the political ambivalence of a lot of these you know, kinds of coexisting practices and coexisting things that um, are kind of hard to reconcile um, with, you know, like the different types of, let's say, environmental politics that are happening in these places and yet coexist and, you know, need to be looked at in these terms. Um, and again, I think that repair is kind of a term that we found really useful for probing um, that, you know, these kinds of uh, coexistences and inconsistencies. I wanted to ask you something about um, the that the legacy of colonialism that in in your in this work appears to be connected to the bogs in Ireland, like a legacy of maybe the, the practices or the dynamics and how how it used to be, you know, when the actual moment where uh, Ireland was a colonized country and how it is developed and what what are these legacies that kind of dynamics of colonization that seem to have been tested in, in Ireland before they were applied anywhere else. And, uh, and, uh, and this, this work has made me think about how, what's the persistence of that in the present and how do you see it through your, your, your research on these particular areas? I mean, one thing that is, is clear is that, um, you know, the bogs since the sort of 17th, 18th century, you know, you look at, um, the kinds of colonial uh, administrators, um, you know, the, the the kinds of these tours, you know, these books, the likes of Arthur Young, you know, who, who did a tour of Ireland. So, so these individuals who, who came to Ireland and were looking through this kind of improving, um, this 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 improving sort of gaze or this sort of colonial gaze as to like, you know, how could this land be made more productive? And one of the things that they they focus on is the is the bogs, you know, the, the, these these sort of swampy uh, you know, environments which around the world ha have been seen as sort of wastelands, wilderness, unproductive. And so from the 17th, 18th century, there were schemes for how to drain the bogs. Um, and those those drainage schemes, I think it was 1819, 1820, there was the bog commissioners. So that was a, you know, a, a fairly big project, one of the very early kind of surveys in Ireland mapping. Um, using these technologies to sort of map these spaces, but with the very specific end of draining them. So trying to see where they could be drained, how they could be drained. Um, and they weren't. I mean, none of these projects came to any fruition. Um, and that's what's interesting is that the free states, so after independence in 1920, 21, um, you know, one of the projects at the end of that decade when Fianna Fáil, um, you know, came into power was how could almost these, it was almost... How could these these plans and proposals of the British be finally realized by the Irish state? You know, and it was very much bound up with this post-colonial nation building, national identity, 
Um, and then finally, you know, that kind of phase, which is the sort of 1930s, 40s, up until about the 1980s, then gets replaced by a more kind of neoliberal shift uh, as the state agency board in Ramona that was responsible for the bugs. Basically, the, the fuel is running out, the peat is running out, and they need to find other uses for these bugs, particularly the cutaway. And that brings us up to the present and where we kind of, we kind of got into this work, which is, you know, using these cutaway bogs for wind farms, for data centers and other kinds of large scale kind of infrastructural projects. But what we trace through all of that is this idea of seeing the bogs as uh, wasteland underutilized and how these bog landscapes can be made valuable or useful through the, the sort of application of certain kinds of technology, certain kinds of science. Um, uh, you know, and that's where the continuity is for us, I think. Um, it's, it's something that's, you know, the idea of the post-colonial in Ireland kind of is unavoidable when you're looking at the institutions and the land, right? So, you know, once you get outside of, you know, these sorts of things, it gets a lot messier. But when you look at institutions in Ireland and, when, you know, state institutions especially, and when you look at land use and spatial development, it is kind of, you know, I find it next to impossible to not kind of um, look at this history before kind of getting to um, anything in the present or moving on to the future. You know, there there is this sort of history, which I just laid, laid out, which is the kind of, you know, colonial, then the kind of post-colonial and the kind of state modernization project. And now, you know, more recently, this kind of, you know, neoliberal um, you know, green data, green energy sort of, um, you know, model of development. But sort of alongside that or underneath it, I don't know what the right metaphor is, are these other forms of, of bog life? You know, Pat used the term submerged perspectives, which is a term we borrow from Gomez uh, Barish, writing in a very different context in Latin America. Uh, but it's, it seemed helpful to us because it is this idea of, of these kinds of minor you know, minor sort of forms of life that is made up by of, of practices of, um, uh, you know, social relationships, but also ecological or, you know, material relationships to the bogs. And the three that we kind of, you know, identify or, or are interested in, in, in researching more on and, and writing about are one is around turf cutting. So, you know, there's a long history, centuries old uh, history of, of cutting turf on the bogs. And where this relates to the commons is that it is, it's, it's sort of, quite literally in, in, in the sense of the kind of historical commons, it's a form of turbary right. So turbary rights is this right to cut turf for your own use. So it's, it's not commercial. And those turbary rights still exist. Um, and, you know, people um, uh, sort of act on those, those turbary rights and they cut turf for their own use. The second form is around, um, uh, more around ecology. Uh, and around these remnants of the bog. So a, a lot of the bogs during the 20th century were drained and cut, as I mentioned, uh, for, for fuel. But there are these remnants, and that's the term that is used by the, the kind of, you know, bog conservationists, these remnants of living bog. So bog that hasn't been damaged, hasn't been drained. And then the third form of life that we talk about is the kind of bog modernity. Uh, and this is, um, you know, since the 50s particularly, where the state stepped in through Board Nimona to sort of industrialize the bogs. And all of that infrastructure and social infrastructure, community infrastructure remains, even though that industry is now, you know, being made redundant. It's been, it's been closed down. It's being shut down. I mean, that's another form of bog life, which is sort of is enduring, you know, in, in some form. And so you have what's so interesting, I think, to us about the bogs and, and this place, the Midlands, is that it has these very different these very different, um, you know, relationships to the bogs, very different kind of subjectivities, very different, um, you know, social economies, ecologies, which are also not completely separate. You know, people who work for the community conservation may also have been former workers in Bordemona, may also be people who cut turf. They're not sort of strictly separated. And what I think is interesting is the way that there's different kinds of economies that are uniting these, part, these various kind of messy things that are, you know, these threads that are kind of fascinating to trace that all kind of circle back to the bog as this place of fascination of this place that, you know, is worth something beyond a, a, um, that is worth something in so many different ways of seeing value and kind of expressing value. Um, and again, this was something when we were kind of trying to draw out 
these different things, you know, we kind of separated it into these three areas. But then what we kind of found in bringing it together at the end is that there is a particular kind of political economy that's bringing these different practices together, whether it's in terms of seeing them as, a part, as disposable as wastelands again, or as kind of bringing them back into a particular kind of value, which, you know, for example, you see the Board of Mona workers being, being re-employed in bog restoration projects in order to um, the in order to make the bogs active again, which is useful because they sequester carbon. I wanted to ask you a little bit about this um, topic that you approach on the linear temporality of rise and ruin um, that makes invisible kind of alternative ways of living with non-humans that have persisted in spite of these rise and ruin temporalities. Uh, maybe you can tell us a bit what you mean by that and then yeah, how this if this if you see these practices um, that, as you say, are mixed, they are not like a kind of ideal of commons uh, staying there, but that they ecologically endure in spite of like this wider temporality of catastrophe. And I found this really interesting, this endurance in spite of the ruins. So if there is something that inspires you to say something about that. Um, yeah, I'd. Um... Well, I mean, one thing I, it would be um, a kind of remiss maybe in the talk about the bogs and our work to not talk about sphagnum moss a little bit, which is what, one of the, the plants that grows on the bog. And, um, you know, it's funny when we kind of, you know, encountered it or we've learned more about it. It's hard not to think about Anna Singh's Matsutake mushroom, you know, and the, the kinds of ways there's, um, you know, thinking and, and Natasha Myers and obviously lots of other people who are thinking about plants and, um, you know, these this moss is is so it's it's so tiny this little plant, but it's it's the thing that builds the bogs, and it's it's called the bog builder, and it has all these incredible properties. Um, not least that most of it is dead, and um, those cells are still function are, are very important because they soak up lots of water, and that's what creates this sort of anaerobic environment. That's what makes the the bog you know semi aqueous. I think one of the things that's interesting about that is that, you know, as we just said, for a long history, the bogs were just seen as a swamp, as in pejoratively, nothing's there. But you look closer and there is this incredible type of, of, of biodiversity, these, these plants and animals that live in this, this very sort of strange, really alien kind of environment. Um, and one of the projects that the state is is sort of ha, has sort of launched with quite a lot of fanfare is this idea of using the bogs for carbon sequestration and that would mean rewetting the bogs um uh, and that would um you know stop you know greenhouse gas emissions but would also ideally would encourage plants to regrow which is what sequesters the carbon and they've made claims about 100 million tons of carbon being sequestered over the next 100 years or something and what's interesting is that a those claims are just not founded on any kind of science really you know um you know they're, they're just figures that seem to be picked out of nowhere but also it's about how the bogs are being in a sense you know presented as a sink for carbon as a place to sort of dump carbon and the emphasis on sequestration on sinks on storage but there's less or no emphasis on something like sphagnum moss and if you think about those longer histories of community conservation and the kinds of the people who live around the bogs who have a, an incredible sort of detailed knowledge of, of the things that grow there, they begin with those plants and a recognition also that the temporalities of something like sphagnum moss go far into the future. You know, that it, it's almost impossible to imagine what a project would be that would, you know, center, you know, the sphagnum moss. So imagining projects that were about how can we care for sphagnum moss? How can we create or, 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 or care for bogs in such a way that plants like sphagnum flourish? How do we make the bogs livable for, for plants like sphagnum and other plants? That would be a very different type of um, approach than thinking about it as large-scale carbon sequestration.